very good evening to you, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the 35th episode of the BASL webinar series. This is a landmark episode for the BASL, and we are celebrating 35 weeks of back-to-back -back knowledge sharing and continuous professional legal development. This series that originated 35 weeks ago has now parallel knowledge sharing platforms. Originally the brainchild of the president of BASL, Kalinga Indratisa PC, and the secretary of the Bar Association, Rajiv Amarasurya, we are thankful and grateful to you for this novel and innovative platform that you've created, which has been of great service to our membership. And of course, this would not have been a success if not for the contribution and the generosity of time of the panel members that we have had thus far. Without further ado, I would like to introduce the topic today, which is a discussion on state lands and land development ordinance. This is your panelist for this evening. Mr. Manohara De Silva, President's Counsel. Mr. De Silva is a President's Counsel practicing in the Superior Courts who was called to the bar in 1988 and was appointed as a President's Counsel in 2006. Mr. De Silva is a member of the Cabinet Appointed Special Expert Committee to draft the new Constitution of Sri Lanka. He is a member of the Law Commission and a Commissioner of the Legal Aid Commission. He served as a member of the Incorporated Council of Legal Education for several years. In 2006, he was appointed by the government to serve in the expert panel of all party representative committee on constitutional reform. Mr. De Silva was also a member of the University Council of the Moratua University and prior to that served as a visiting lecturer. He has also served in the executive committee of the Bar Association of Sri Lanka and in SARC law. Mr. De Silva has authored several books and papers on constitutional reform. We also have with us Mr. Vikum Di Abru, welcome sir, who is a senior deputy solicitor general at the Attorney General's Department of Sri Lanka. He holds a master's of laws degree from the International Maritime Law Institute in Malta and the University of Colombo. He counts for over 26 years of experience in litigation as a counsel representing the government. He has authored a book titled Adequacy of the International Legal Regimes and published several articles on civil procedure and the law of the sea. He has been a visiting lecturer and examiner at Sri Lanka Law College on civil procedure for more than 14 years. He regularly co conducts lectures at various symposiums on civil procedure, law of the sea and admiralty law. We also have with us Shanta Jawadana, who holds a LL, LLB from University of London. Mr. Jawadana also holds his LLM in constitutional and administrative law from the University of Colombo. He practices public law in Court of Appeal and the Supreme Court and counts for over 18 years in experience. Mr. Jayawardena also serves as a visiting lecturer in administrative law at the Open University of Sri Lanka. We also have with us Ms. Sudarshini Kure, having obtained her BSc in management degree from the University of Sabragamo, she completed her LLB from the Open University of Sri Lanka and was enrolled as an attorney at law in December 2006. Ms. Kure also holds an LLM from University of Colombo and she has been in active practice for the past 11 years, focusing mainly on civil appeal matters in the Supreme Court and Court of Appeal. Our moderator for this evening is Ms. Tushani Machado, who holds a Bachelor of Law, of law Honours from the University of London and a Master's from the University of London as well. She was called to the bar in 1997 from Lincoln's Inn and was admitted as an attorney at law in 1998. Ms. Machado has extensive experience in the field of public law and has on several landmark matters appeared in the appellate courts in applications filed under State Lands Recovery of Possession Act and the Land Development Ordinance. Ms. Machado, over to you. We would now begin with Mr. Manohara De Silva. Yes. But, it's, uh, 
It's not very clear. Can you hear? I can't hear Constitutional you. aspect. Uh, now, can you hear, uh, Tushan? Can you unmute, sir? sir go ahead, sir. Uh, I need to unmute or what? Have you muted, sir? We can hear you. Ah, okay. All right. Uh, if you, uh, yeah, tell me if you can't hear me. Now, <clears throat> the topic of today's webinar is yes, state. Sir, yeah. Sorry, you can hear because I can't hear you. Yes. Sir. Yes. Can I can hear you, sir. Okay. Yes, sir. Go ahead. Right. Uh, the topic that uh, uh, that. Uh, under this the under discussion is state land and land development ordinance and i think the moderator has requested me to deal with the constitutional uh, the uh, aspects of uh, the uh, state land now the first article that i would like to refer to is article 33 2f which gives the president the power of alien alienating state land uh, Article 33.2 F says that grants and dispositions of land and other immovable property of the Republic is vested in the President. Now, why is it important for us today to discuss whether uh, the, uh, the, this question, whether state land is with the state or with any other uh, organ of the state is because of the 13th Amendment. Now, the 13th Amendment in Article 154 PF uh, gave the High Court jurisdiction, writ jurisdiction, parallel to the Court of Appeal, provided that the subject matter falls within the Provincial Council's list. So, with regard to any matter dealing with state land, the question is, if it falls within the provincial council list, then it then the high court would have jurisdiction. But if it does not come within the provincial council list, uh, the pro the high court will not have jurisdiction. So, for a from from the practitioner's perspective, it is important that we ascertain whether state land is a provincial council subject or whether it comes under the central uh, the government of Sri Lanka. Now, I think that question has now been resolved with the uh, case Superintendent Stafford Estate versus Selimuttu Rasu's case reported in 2013, one Sri Lanka law, law report, where uh, the court unanimously held that it is it does not come within the provincial council list. So uh, safely, we can go on the basis that the high, provincial high court will not have jurisdiction with regard to state land. Uh, the issue became, uh, of course, it is a, uh, a three judgment decision of the Supreme Court. So until that order is reversed, uh, the question whether state land is provincial council or uh, uh, central is uh, is not an important uh, uh, consideration. So uh, uh, right now, I think the, the the problem arose because of uh, uh, in Appendix Two under the Provincial Council list, uh, it is stated in uh, Paragraph One Point Three that alienation or disposition of state land within a province to any citizen or any organization shall be by the president on the advice of the provincial council. So the question was whether the president could alienate property without the advice of the provincial council if uh, the uh, state land came within the purview of the provincial council list. Now that this case has decided that state land is no longer in the provincial council list, uh, the provincial high court will have no jurisdiction. Then coming on to the question whether uh, uh, on this uh, land development ordinance, uh, now the question, if you don't have jurisdiction, if the High Court has no jurisdiction, then where do you go? 
what would how would you advise a client who cannot afford to go to the court of appeal by way of judicial review or who cannot afford to go to the supreme court then in their respective regions will they have a remedy is one question i think that we need to address our mind because after all we are there to resolve uh, issues faced by the public and uh, our coming to a conclusion that the provincial high court has no jurisdiction and therefore you have to end up in uh, a court in colombo is no answer uh, one uh, uh, advice that i can give you is that we can make use of the declaratory power of the district court uh, now you know under section 217 of the civil procedure code the court and under the common law uh, the district court can declare a right of status if you read the uh, as you all most of you know as um, uh, section 217 uh, gives the right to declare a right of status then we also have uh, the uh, uh, power to issue injunctions under the provisions of the judicature the district court can issue injunctions um, to prevent some injury uh, to a, to the party who is seeking that injunction now uh, this these two remedies can be made use of uh, without resorting to judicial review in the provincial high court since with regard to state land provincial council has no jurisdiction so if you for instance if you uh, if the if the dispute is with regard to a permit as to whether a permit has been issued or whether a permit or a grant a, a person is entitled to a, 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 a grant or a permit then maybe you can invoke the jurisdiction of the district court and seek a declaration that you are entitled to such right and any uh, kind of um, uh, violation of that right can be stopped by way of an injunction uh, against a party who 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 is disturbing your right so uh, so th- those are two alternative remedies that is available uh, if if you, if your client cannot afford to invoke the jurisdiction uh, of the court of appeal because now it has been decided that with regard to state land the provincial high court has no jurisdiction so i think that's a just a introductory remark with regard to since i was asked to uh, deal with the constitutional aspect i thought that it would be uh, better for us to know the alternatives available if we get a client who cannot afford to go to colombo and retain the services of a council in colombo Uh, by invoking the jurisdiction of the court of appeal or the supreme court so maybe uh, of course you, we know that with regard to a public officer you have to give notice under section 461 of the civil procedure code so that uh, problem is there but notwithstanding that it is there is some remedy that is available to uh, to uh, the public who, who who may not have the choice of coming to the court of appeal uh, I'll stop at that uh, if, uh, and we can proceed with our discussion. Thank you, sir. Now we will go to uh, Mr. Vikram Riyabu. Vikram, will you just give us an overview of the state lands uh, recovery of position act, please, for the benefit of our viewers? Vikram? can you hear me yes can you please give us a brief overview of the yes. state yeah. Uh, yeah topic for today is state land this topic include both administration and alienation of state land under the state lands uh, under the state lands ordinance and the land development ordinance these two laws have its own mechanism to take over the law of possession quite apart from that so the state also has to take also has to take over the law of possession uh, from encroachers so in order to address that issue there is a special law 
that is called state plan recovery of position land. Before I discuss the provisions of the state plan recovery of the position land, I would like to briefly explain how the state became or the become the owner of state. Looking back at the history, the king was the sole owner of state land. The, la the lands were alienated by the king under certain circumstances. I don't, I'm not going to discuss those circumstances, but this is lucidly explained by Haley in his book, Singly Slow and Faster. Thereafter, during the Dutch period, lands were given to individual like chiefs and headmen while they are holding office or as remuneration. These lands were neither heritable or alienable. Major changes in land policy had taken place during the British colonial era. Uh, the Crown became the owner of land due to operations of several ordinances such as Crown Lands Enforcement Ordinance and Wastelands Ordinance. The Wasteland Ordinance was later replaced by Land Settlement Ordinance. The land, the state also acquires land under Land Acquisition Act, Land Resumption Ordinance, and Land Grant Special Provision Act. As Mr. Manohar Tisila rightly pointed out, only His Excellency the President is empowered to dispose state land in terms of our State, state Land Recovery Portion Act is the main enactment to take over the lost position of state lands expeditiously. The state land is defined in section 18 of, of the Act. According to the set definition, state land means the land to which state is lawfully entitled to or which may be disposed of by the state together with any building including the lands owned by the Land Reform Commission and several other state agencies. The state lands procedure, state land recovery of state land recovery procedure starts with sending the quit notice by the competent authority. Before the quit notice is dispatched, the competent authority is required in terms of section 31 of the act to form an opinion that the subject matter is the state land and that the party concerned is in unauthorized possession or occupation there. Now it is observed so in court that persons who receive quit notices generally challenge the said notices on two grounds, mainly on two grounds. A, the sender of the quit notice is not the competent authority. B, the particular land is not a state land. Competent authority is defined in the in the act as government agent or so AGA, GA, AGA, that means the district secretary, divisional secretary, and includes commanders of resources, general manager of railways. And if you look at that, you can see the list. The legal status or the capacity of the competent authority to issue quit notice can only be challenged at the very inception by way of a writ and not in the magistrate court. The competent authority in arriving, arriving at his opinion is not required to carry out an inquiry with regard to the title of the person who is in unauthorized position. However, the competent authority must form an opinion on a rational basis as the decision will have far-reaching consequences. With regard to the identity of the land, the aggrieved person can challenge the quit notice by way of quit again, as held in Namrupa Plantation versus Nimal Kumsheva, the CAPHC APN 29 of 2016, Court of Appeal Minutes 9-7-2008. As Mr. Manohar Dishilla rightly pointed out, uh, the quit notice can be challenged only by way of written in the Court of Appeal and not in the High Court. So he cited the 
the famous judgment on that, the Sol uh, Solimuturas versus the Fidden uh, Stafford Estate Tragal judgment that is equal in 2013. Now, after serving the quit notice, if the person fails to comply with the said quit notice, the competent authority may make an application uh, to the magistrate court in terms of section 5 of that. Time and again, our courts have held that the competent authority must strictly comply with the schedule. schedule. There are there are schedules because the quit notice there is scheduled, there's a schedule for, for there's a schedule for uh, all the requirements under section five. Now under section six of that, the person who receives the quit notice has to show cause as to why he should not be ejected. The scope of the inquiry is set out in section nine of that. The respondent is not entitled to challenge the matter set out in the applications file under section five of the act, except that he remains on a land on a valid permit or written authority of the state in accordance with the written law. Section 9 takes away the magistrate's power to inquire into any other matter uh, set out in Section 5. The word written law is defined in Article 170 of the Constitution as well as Section 2 of the Interpretation of the uh, in a very recent judgment, uh, the Court of Appeal uh, interpreted the word written law in respect of uh, state land. Uh, in respect of state land, that is, the judgment is General Manager Railways versus Padmanathan, CAMC Revision 28 of 2016. This Court of Appeal minutes uh, 20, 20th. November 2020. Because generally, what generally what happens is sometimes the government gives a gives a land to or the or the another agency uh, takes over the or the go, go into the position, and sometimes they they give a lease or, or, or lease to a person, and there are when the when the first day, when the first government uh, institution wants the land back. So what they do is they file it under state land to the portion. So in that event, the 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 person concerned will come and will come to court and show the the lease that has been given by the second day. So that so this judgment deals with the situation like that. So I think it is apt to read that uh, judgment. So the burden is on the respondent to prove that he remains on a land on a valid permit or written authority. It is important that to highlight that oral evidence should not be allowed since the burden has to be discharged by producing documentary. So I have seen in court so the people, so the 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 so the respondent uh, they they try to lead oral evidence with regard to possession. So there is no right of appeal against the judgment of the magistrate, but a revision application can be preferred. In a revision application, the petitioner need not show exceptional ground, but has to demonstrate illegality and procedural irregularity as held in Javadana versus Satnayaka, 2007, 1SLR 209. The revision application lies to the High Court under Article 154 P3D of the Constitution. Now, the aggrieved party may vindicate his title in terms of Section 12 of that. Section 12 of that deals with two distinct classes of persons, namely, any person who has been ejected from a, from the, from a land under the Act, or any person claiming to be the owner of the land. So the according to uh, according to uh, the Sumanauti versus uh, Attorney General uh, CA nine nine four two thousand final uh, decided on five nine two thousand and nineteen, the court held 
that the revenue cardio provided by common law is available to an owner uh, claiming the set land on a deed or a set or on a claiming a land on a deed this right has been extended by the legislator or person who is not the owner but was in the possession of the land from which he was dispossessed under the act under that now now the question now the question is whether the res judicata applies because sometimes what happens is what happens division of secretary files an application due to some technical difficult technical error the application is withdrawn or dismissed the question is whether another application can be filed so the, the so it is very clear that these are continuing offenses and therefore therefore uh, the 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 restudicata will will not apply so uh, there are several judgments uh, on that uh, of course not on this particular point but on the continuing offenses uh thank you kushan for giving me the question uh before me if i were to ask you now in terms of the notice under the state lands it is addressed yes. look at the schedule yes. it is addressed the the quick notice in, um, being of the opinion that you and they say within brackets to state the name so which means it is addressed only to you say person a in the event person a passes away after the institution then you cannot proceed against his dependents am i right yeah, okay now i i i understood your question even though there was a disturbance so the 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 Uh, action or the not action as well. The application can be filed only against a live person, right? So that's the first principle in law. So if the person has uh, passed away, so of course then then we we cannot sort of substitute it. Probably it will be withdrawn and filed again. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? I think uh, Tushani has gone out of the. Okay. Okay. Shantar, please give us a brief outline of the state lands ordinance, Shantar. Yeah, <clears throat> thank you very much, Tushani. The, the topic or the statute assigned to me is the state lands ordinance. The state lands ordinance is uh, can be called loosely. the more the general statute relating to state lands compared to the other statutes dealing with state lands uh, if you look at the statutes that we have had and we are ha having in in our statute book for the at the current at the, currently the statutes <coughs> those statutes can be loosely put into two categories the the first one category is are uh, the statutes designed to take over land Uh, and title of land uh, for the state, such as the, uh, uh, the, the uh, 
land settlement ordinance, land resumption ordinance, and then the in the colonial the the wasteland ordinance, which, which was operative during the colonial period and, and, and a few decades later, until a few decades later, it was repealed. <clears throat> the Land Acquisition Act, land reform law, all those statutes, they are designed to take over land for the state and to give title to the state. <clears throat> then there's another set of legislation statutes, which are designed to alienate state lands. For instance, the the, the Land Development Ordinance, Land Grants Special Provisions Act of 1979. Those are designed to give away or to or, or for disposition of state land to individuals or, or, or co co body, body corporates or societies. Uh, in this in this uh, context, the uh, state lands ordinance is more kind of a general statute, which which deals with two aspects. Uh, on on one hand, uh, the state lands ordinance is is designed to to reaffirm or the reiterate the state's the republic's right over water streams, public lakes, the foreshore, which which under the Roman Dutch law were were, were classified as race publica or or race communis. So those have been given statutory recognition and, and vested in the state and placed under the administration of the state. Then on the other hand, <coughs> a bit similar uh, to the state lands land development ordinance, the state lands ordinance also provide for alienation of, alienation of state lands. <coughs> but uh, look at compare with the land development ordinance, the, the alienation, the powers, the modality of alienation under the state lands ordinance is, is different from the modality of alienation under the land development ordinance. Because it is, it is, it is known that the, that the intention of, of the, or the, the purpose behind the land development ordinance was to, was to give lands, uh, especially in, in various um, uh, settlement schemes, to peasant communities, mainly for agriculture, because the, the, the purposes under for which the land can be alienated and will be alienated under the state lands ordinance are, are, are different. Of course, there is no prohibition in granting land for, for, for agriculture purposes or to a member of, of from, a, from agricultural class or the middle class. Uh, but, but there's no prohibition, but still the more the design, the more specific statute for alienating lands for the present class, for the farmers, for the middle class, is the is the uh, land development ordinance. The the modality, the difference in the modality, is that uh, under section two of the of the uh, uh, of the uh, state lands ordinance, the president of the republic has the power to alienate land by way of grants, way of lease, sale permits for occupation. And the land, the, the grants also, either it can be an absolute grant or a conditional or a provisional grant. <clears throat> Whereas under the under the land development ordinance, of course, you you once you get the grant, the modality of succession, uh, the, the, how, how it devolves on your heirs is there laid down in the statute. However, under the land, the state lands ordinance, the state lands ordinance does not provide specific mechanism for devolution, but if it is, if but um, but it is left open, left open for the for the president or the delegated authorities who, who alienate lands uh, to to by way of conditions in the instrument of disposition to lay down whether it's an absolute absolute. A outright grant or a provisional grant or a provisional lease or the period for which the lease is granted, the period for which the permit is granted, whether it's annual or, 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 or long term. So, the, so there, is, there is a wide, discre wide discretion under the state lands, or, and state lands ordinance as to the modality in which the land is alienated. However, under the land development ordinance, the modality is there in the statute. First, you get a permit under section 19, 
uh, one or two then if you develop the land to the satisfaction of the authorities then you get a grant so the the successor is 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 nom is named in the in the permit and then the same nomination matures to a nomination under the grant the succession is very clear so under the state lands ordinance it's it's, it's widely uh, kept open and 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 uh, section 16 of the state lands ordinance uh 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 states that unless unless if the unless the the statute unless the unless the instrument of dispersion for instance the lease or the grant uh, uh, says otherwise when the when the grant or the lease is on a personal to the holder basis the moment the, uh, the holder dies the rights end there it doesn't devolve and in fact uh, in a in a recent judgment of uh, of the supreme court sc appeal number 39a/2010 sc minutes uh uh 112/2015 that judgment by exclusive justice uh sister dia bru uh, in fact the statute is very clear the supreme court reaffirms that unlike in a case of a permit under the land development ordinance uh in view of section 16 of the state lands ordinance once the the holder dies unless the instrument specifically says it devolves or there is an absolute outright transfer or a grant the rights end there and and also the reversion it rights the rights the revert to the state the land reverts to the state with the improvements then of course uh, in in few respects the state lands ordinance is interlinked to the land development ordinance that, that is with regard to the <coughs> uh, violation of conditions and then non payment of charges due to the state so if if a permit holder or, or a lease uh, lessee under the state land uh, instrument under the state lands ordinance violates a condition in the in the permit or the lease or the grant then he has to be the inquiry has to be held a hearing has to be given as laid down in the provisions uh uh as laid down as 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 the proceed in terms of the procedure laid down in the land, De land development ordinance in sections 106 to 128 and similarly non payment of of uh, in case of non payment of uh, dues as well the same procedure applies uh 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 if uh, the the inquiry or the hearing has to be in terms of the procedure laid down in the land development ordinance so to that extent it's it's linked to the land development ordinance with regard to the procedure of of deciding whether he has violated the condition or whether he has defaulted in payment of charges due to the state and and in another in, 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 uh, there's another connection to the or uh, link to the land development ordinance that is if in case of uh, in 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 a situation where the the permit or the grant or the lease is cancelled or terminated then the ejection procedure is again under the land development ordinance the uh, the set uh, the land uh, land uh, state lands ordinance refers to uh, refers to section 120 procedure of ejectment shall apply in respect of uh, in for for ejectment uh <clears throat> of a person who is violated do not uh, not paid the dues to the state uh, so to that extent is linked to the land development ordinance for hearing and ejectment is linked to the land development ordinance but the modality of of alienation is different and also uh, also i must uh, mention the the uh, state lands ordinance provides for 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 for, for stipulating a period for which the permit or the grant of the lease is granted uh, is 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 the uh, the land is alienated for instance it can be say said that the lease is for 30 years the provisional grant is for, for 10 years or or likewise the period of the of the of the alienation can be specified in the statute whereas under the under the land development ordinance there is no such such restriction 
it's one it's it's only speaks of a permit and then you develop to to the satisfaction authorities you get the the get the grant which the, the permit matures to a grant <clears throat> so there is there is a fundamental different in the in the in this in the modalities but also there is a link between the two statutes with regard to the hearings and and the procedure for ejectment and uh, 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 then also the powers with regard to the uh, uh, powers with regard to alienation is is a, the section 20 of uh, statute provides for for delegation of powers then in fact the, there are uh, orders made under the state lands ordinance delegating powers to the commission of lands the minister the government agents <clears throat> with regard to various powers uh, of, in administration of the state lands ordinance then uh, uh, then also of course uh, important section section i believe mr ikumbi abdu will have to say a lot on this section 103 of the of the of the uh, state lands ordinance which which says that uh, lands which have been declared to be state or declared in favor of the state after the enactment of the state lands ordinance in 1947, uh, the, the, in respect of those lands, the, 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 there is no prescription, can't prescript, can't, can't acquire rights by prescription. If the land is settled or resumed in favor of the state or acquired in favor of the state under the land resumption ordinance, the land settlement ordinance, or the Land Acquisition Act, if it has been done after 19, 19, 1947, that is the date after the date of uh, coming into operation of the State Lands Ordinance. So that's 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 a brief prospectus of the State Lands Ordinance. And uh, and 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 of course, before I, before before I wind up, one one uh, uh, Mr. Mr. Diabu responded to a question that had been. Uh, Directed to us by one of the one of the participants as to as to the application of the concept of race to Tigata in as regards state lands, and uh, of course uh, I of course uh, beg to differ with uh, Mr. Abru with regard to race to Tigata. There is a judge, recent judgment of uh, Justice Samayavardhan in here it application number uh, two forty nine slash two thousand thirteen two forty nine slash two thousand thirteen Court of Appeal minutes 15-11-2019, where the, where the divisional secretary resorted to the uh, State Lands Recovery Procedure, the Recovery Act, uh, uh, for the fifth time or the fifth or the sixth time, uh, the, the petitioners in that application challenged the quit notice of, uh, of those five attempts under the, in the Magistrate's Court two had been dismissed or three had been dismissed on, on preliminary matters such as jurisdiction and, 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 and the death of the party notified. But there, was, there were two cases adjudicated on merits uh, saying that the, that the respondent had a certificate of quiet possession issued under the, under the 1840, uh, 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 which uh, that 1840 ordinance uh, that is, uh, 1840 uh, Crown Lands Encroachment Ordinance Number 12 of 1840. So there, of course, uh, the Court of Appeal uh, judgment just is not mine is somewhere there as it then was held that the concept of race judicata applies because the, already the, the the matter had been tried twice on merits and and the magistrate uh, the High Court had affirmed. That since the since the petitioner in this application had a certificate of quiet possession under that old ordinance, they cannot for the sixth time issue a quit notice. Uh, but I but I heard that the honourable attorney general has preferred a special leave to appeal application to the Supreme Court. I don't know whether it has been heard as yet. So uh, so uh, so those are those are my my thoughts on 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 the state lands ordinance and also on the. On the, on the application of concept of race judicata uh, as as raised by one of the participants. So thank you. Shanta, now you suggest you you, uh, you were telling us about section sixteen of the state lands ordinance. 
that um, there is no right of succession. So a person would then would, who has developed the land is in a predicament. He would rather get a permit under the LDO. Don't you think so? What are your views on that? It, it depends on the condition laid down in the in the in the in the instrument. For instance, now section four, se uh, section. Uh, can you all hear me? Yes, I can hear. Yeah, section two uh, one says that the president may, in the name of the republic, make absolute or provisional grants of state land. And so, if uh, I think if if the if the grant is absolute, and then of course it devolves on 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 his heirs. Uh, but if it is provisional, for instance, if it said for for 10 years, 20 years, and it is personal to the holder, then of course the law is very clear. Law is very clear. It does not devolve. And, and, and the reversionary rights are with the state. The, the land will revert to the state. And, 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 also, in, and also in this context, we must, we must uh, have in mind that the, there is a, there is a, there, the land due under the land development ordinance, which is specifically designed to alienate lands for the peasant community, the agricultural class, is is there. So there are, there is one one provision in, in 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 the regulations framed under the land state lands ordinance, saying that uh, that preferably for the agricultural class and the middle class, the it is it is it is appropriate to grant alienate lands under the land development ordinance. Instead of instead of the state lands ordinance. Thank you, Sam. Next, we will go to Sudarshini Kure, who will give us a brief outline on the land development ordinance. Sudarshini, over to you. Thank you, Tushani. Uh, as uh, explained by uh, Mr. Vikram Diabro and uh, Mr. Shanta Jayawardana, uh, it is true that the land development ordinance mainly focuses on the alienation of lands. Uh, now, there was earlier a misconception that uh, when you have a permit or a grant, in fact, a permit, that a revendicatio action cannot be filed. But uh, that is not correct. Uh, by the judgment, Palisena versus Piasena, uh, that is 56 NLR uh, 407, one of the most celebrated judgments, it has been held that uh, the, a permit holder has uh, a permit, if I may read it, uh, a permit holder has sufficient title to file a revendicatio action against a trespasser. So in, in such cases, when you file a revendicatio action in the district court, it is important to ask for a declaration uh, that you are the lawful uh, formal title holder and you have a right to be in possession and uh, be in that land and you must ask for the ejectment of the trespasser. Uh, later, by several judgments, it has been upheld that a permit holder can eject a trespasser. Uh, there's one uh, very recent judgment of uh, His Lordship Justice, uh, Justice E. G. R. Amarasekar, uh, SC Appeal Number 20 of 2010, delivered on 18th of December 2020, where the, all the aspects of a revindicative action filed under the LDO has been discussed. Uh, land development ordinance, in fact, uh, Tushani, uh, it's a vast area. Uh, I don't think we have much time to cover all the areas. Uh, is it Tushani? Yes. Uh, so we will, I will uh, limit it to uh, the area where the issue, uh, the, the very uh, important issues uh, firstly, I would like to discuss the these grants and permits can be issued by the divisional secretary. And 
a permit can be cancelled uh, by the divisional secretary under uh, the section uh, and 104 of the land development ordinance and when it comes to a grant it can only be cancelled by the president of the republic uh, so very few instances uh, there have been uh, in my uh, very short uh, term of practice where a person has asked for a cancellation of a grant so, so that's most I, yeah. yes interpose you recently the court of appeal yes yeah. its application 81 of 2018 cnds yeah. 16th of june 2020 uh, the court of appeal uh, cancelled the grant issued a request certiorari because uh -huh. it issued on incorrect information. That is right. That is right. So, yeah, uh, on that, on that, Tushani, there is a, uh, a famous uh, judgment of yes. uh, another unreported case, and I don't know whether it's reported. It's also unreported. Yes. Uh, that is uh, RIV Jayaratna versus Land Commission and others. Mm -hmm. uh, that is uh, Justice, uh, His Lordship, uh, Chief Justice, Justice Saratan Silva's judgment, where the grant has been made by the President on the basis of incorrect information. Uh, in fact, uh, it was referred back to the Divisional Secretary to he see whether it should be. Back. Yes, that's right. He also, it was cancelled and referred back. Yeah, so that can be done. Yes. So the court of even the court of appeal does not have power to, uh, or the not the Supreme Court. It's yes. actually on the recommendation of the divisional secretary or maybe court that it's the president who can actually cancel a grant. And uh, the next point I would like to discuss is the succession. Succession uh, is. Uh, where if the uh, grantor does not nominate anybody under the third schedule of the land development ordinance, uh, it has to be uh, looked, the, the succession comes under the third schedule of the ordinance where the, the male, first male child, then the daughters, and then goes on like that. Uh, and if there is no succession, if he does not have a spouse or he has not nominated anybody, that land reverts back to state. Very few instances are like that. Uh, and the nomination can be only done according to the third schedule. Uh, the nomination, the succession starts from section 48 of the ordinance. And the nomination is from uh, 73, 74, 75. Uh, and also, uh, the grant token make a last will and say that he intends to pass his rights to a certain person. But the last will has to be registered within three months, according to the uh, LDO land development ordinance and uh, and the dispositions specifically the dispositions that that is alienation of state land so supposing a person has a grant can he dispose that uh, right uh, now that can be done only on the uh, under section 19 uh, 194B with the prior approval of the divisional secretary. You can dispose uh, that is only of a that is only a grant, not a permit. The rights of a holding can be only uh, alienated on the prior approval of the government agent. And you can even have the right or title this to mortgage these grants that is under the under the land development ordinance you can only mortgage it to, it to state banks even that uh, is 
it has been extended those rights have been extended up so far uh, to help these uh, people to doing agriculture uh, in fact the object of the land development ordinance is to benefit the people the farmers to do their agriculture uh, so that it will uh, in turn benefit the country uh, so uh, i will discuss any questions regarding uh, tushani uh, so we have only about uh, maybe 15 20 minutes to wrap up we could uh, go on a little more we will yeah. have another 10 or 15 minutes yeah uh, so then uh, my question to you is merely because the permit holder has nominated yeah person he does not automatically uh, become entitled to succession unless he has to comply with certain conditions am i not right yes tushani that uh, permit that person who has been nominated has to uh, register the nomination yes he has to register the nomination but there is one case law which says that if you if the permit holder has nominated someone Uh, the he will be entitled to a grant he will be entitled to a grant i will give you the reference that is psan versus vijay singh and others that is 2002 2 slr 242 that is uh, even if you are a permit holders nominated successor you are entitled to a grant yes thank you and also uh, the reason there is a recent case uh, of um, uh, i believe uh, it's sc appeal 47 of 2012 as i highlighted merely because he was nominated it does not automatically uh, transfer the land to the successor it is contingent upon him fulfilling certain requirements let's try to shani that is under section uh, 68 that yes. is you have to uh, the successor has to get possession of the land within 6 months of the yes yeah 6 months of the disease uh, person this is uh, permit holder 68 of the uh, land development ordinance yes thank you sudarshi now thank you go back to uh, the state lands recovery of possession act uh, i would like to ask uh, mr manohar de silva sir uh, now this whole point of uh, you being in possession of a written agreement if you can explain it to us because the case law seems to suggest that it has to be on a disagreement this whole aspect of written law and uh, that has been gone into in ramsey the ports authority matter morgan engineering if you can uh, I, i didn't understand what you say sorry yes. no this whole aspect of being in possession of a valid agreement there have been instances where court has turned down if you are a monthly tenant saying there is no uh, notarially executed agreement like a lease agreement and if you can uh, discuss yes. uh, no uh, now the section says yes. that it must be a permit or a written authority yes that's right so uh, the 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 uh, authority suggests that you can't supposing you are an over, uh, holding lessee yes uh, you cannot rely on that agreement and say that that is a permit that's right uh, so unless of course you have been uh, given you 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 have to come you have to be entitled to possess possess the possess the uh, land yes. if you are not entitled to possess the land by way of some authority then if you if your lease agreement has lapsed and the state wants to evict you can invoke the jurisdiction of the uh, provisions of the state land recovery opposition act merely having a lapsed uh, lease wouldn't uh, come within the definition of a permit or authority 
Yes. Then sometimes uh, the petitioners have urged court to consider whether if if you are in breach of that, let's say non-payment of rentals, whether you should go to the district court since it's a breach of contract. And then, of course, the judgments, uh, the authority suggests otherwise that that you can have a parallel action in the district court as well, but that it does not take away. Uh, what are your views on that, sir? Vishana, I think uh, yeah, because everything depends on the facts of uh, each case. So we can't kind of give a frame to uh, work uh, as a solution to this. But I think what is important is that when a client comes with a notice, uh, often a mistake uh, that sometimes we do is to fight it in the magistrate court. And at the end of the magistrate's court, when you when you are uh, ejected, then only you 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 are seeking of uh, establishing your mm -hmm. rights. Then it is far too late in the day. The moment client comes with a uh, summons, because probably he has ignored the notice uh, that he has received by the state earlier. Now the message that we need to give to the junior practitioners is that uh, now by the time he comes to you, he comes with a summons. Because when the original notice uh, comes, he throws the notice away because it doesn't affect him. Then when the, he gets uh, summons only, he gets activated. Now, even when you get the summons, rather than fighting it in the magistrate's court, which you, of course, have to respond to the summons and go to the magistrate's court, but immediately you need to advise your client if he has some legitimate claim to the land, then you need to challenge the notice that he that was served on him. Now, by, that, by way of a by either by way of a writ application or by way of a, a declaratory action in the district court, because a notice you can challenge it. You can also challenge whether supposing it is your private land and the state is claim. This this is more complicated because. Sometimes there can be a situation where you're in possession of a land. The state is saying that it is state land and gives certain boundaries and description of the land, which refers to some other land and not the land that you are living. Now, the question is, the land occupied by your client, is it the land described in the notice or is it the land described in your deed or in whatever uh, uh, authority that you have? So in a case like that, sometimes a writ application may not be successful because it may be difficult to show because the, the, the state may have a claim to the land described in his notice. The, uh, the, the, your client may have a claim to the land described in his deed. But the question is whether the land in which you are in possession is the land described by the state or the land described uh, in your deed. Now, in a situation like that, the ideal situation would be to file a district court action straight away because you may have to identify the boundaries of the notice. You may have to identify the boundaries of the of your deed or whatever uh, lease agreement or whatever that you may have on which you, you are possessing the land. And maybe you need to superimpose that and show that the land you are in possession is the land in your deed and not the land that is described in the notice. Now, that may be difficult to do it in a writ application to demonstrate that it might be difficult. You may have to bring surveyors, you have to may have to produce deeds, you may have to produce plans and establish that the land in which you are actually in possession is, uh, is, the, is not a state land. Now, we know no, the case law, what it says is that the opinion of the competent authority is not a just subjective opinion, but there must be a rational um, a rational reason for the... Now, I think that is now settled, that the, that the, that the opinion, he can't say, I, this is my opinion. Yes. Uh, there must be some rational basis to form that opinion. There is if, a if there is no rational, yes, if there is no uh, rational basis to form that opinion, 
then uh, the, the notice can be challenged. Now the question is with regard to facts. So we, we that is why I say it is sometimes difficult to decide whether it should be a writ application or whether you should straight away go to the district court because sometimes the facts of the case it may be difficult to uh, achieve what you want in a in a in a uh, in a writ application. So the remedy of um, remedy of uh, uh, going always we must not think that. With regard to any case, we can succeed if we go, go and file a writ application because if you can't establish that the that the land in which you are in possession uh, is what the uh, land is not the land that the state has this uh, uh, described in his permit. There is one other thing, Tichani, before uh, I, you uh, before we uh, finish, I need to say that the interpretation of the term permit holder. Now, uh, all of you, I think Sudarshini and uh, the others uh, mentioned that uh, even a permit holder or a, a, a grantee can uh, uh, can file a revindicative action to establish a title. Uh, Section 12 uh, allows that also. Now, the question is, if you don't have a permit, a plan comes to you, the land has been given by the state, they have been there for generations on the land. Uh, uh, the state recognizes him, but you don't have a permit. Then what do you do? If you don't have that piece of paper, uh, is that the end of the uh, your your uh, your right? No, because uh, it is important to uh, note that the word permit holder is interpreted in the uh, in the land development. A wider interpretation is given, which is very very, very important, which can be made use of by, uh, I'll just read that mean, uh, permit holder means any person to whom a permit has been issued and includes a person who is in occupation of any land alienated to him on a permit, although no permit has actually been issued to him. So sometimes if the, if the land has been allocated and in the ledger uh, the, his name is there, but in fact the permit has not been issued, uh, in a district court action, you can summon the, the authorities and lead that evidence to show that you are a permit holder within the meaning of the land development ordinance. Because now if you go and just file a writ application, uh, you may not have a permit and the court will say, sorry, uh, you have not proved that you are a uh, permit holder. So, uh, so the, now it is true that under the Right to Information Act, you can uh, get these documents, but what if they don't give? Often we, we ask for documents and it, we don't get it. So if you don't get it, then uh, by the time you institute action in the Supreme Court and get that document, you have probably lost possession. So uh, yeah, it is, it is uh, uh, interesting to note this wider interpretation, uh, which can be made use of to, to resolve a lot of issues. We are People don't have, but but whose name is there in the files of the of the of the state? Yes. Then one more question, sir. Now, in there is a recent case, this SC appeal two forty six of two thousand fourteen, divisional secretary of Kalutara versus K M Jayati, sir. SC minutes of fourth August twenty seventeen, a judgment by Justice Uparya Beratna. There, his lordship held that the High Court had set aside the order of the magistrate purely on a technicality that the competent authority had not given 30 days notice to the respondent in terms of section 3. And therefore, the High Court held that the application before the magistrate was defective. However, sir, they, they held otherwise. Now, my question to you is, if it goes to jurisdiction, can't it be taken at any time? Yes, if it goes into the jurisdiction, if there is a precondition, precondition has not been fulfilled, you can. You can. Uh, you can. Uh, sir, when, when interpreting statutes which encroach on person's rights and property rights, especially, then the strict uh, there has to be strict uh, compliance. Uh, uh, the uh, no. we have. Now, now, the, now, again, we go back to what Vikum was saying. Yes. That the question is, 
uh, if some some precondition is not fulfilled they will withdraw the notice and then do all that and come again so it is important that you address the core issue sometimes we lose we go behind some technical objection and win win the case for the client for the moment i mean uh, sometimes we may we, we may we may succeed but the the it is only a few months that the client will have the benefit of it so um, i would generally look at it rather than from a technical point by winning your client may not have the benefit of because they have limited resources and each time the state files a notice and then there is some defect now often i have appeared in cases the other schedule is wrong then they withdraw now the client has by that time retained us we have appeared in court we have taken uh, objections preliminary objections the point that you raised certain uh, uh, preconditions are not fulfilled they very generously come and say we are withdrawing the notice and the <laughs> next week they file another notice now the client has to uh, again come and retain us in a new case because we have to again draft papers the facts are now different now the i think the important message that we need to give our junior members of the bar is winning a battle is not the thing we must win the war so uh, uh, we must not let the state just wriggle out of a situation and say the moment they a defect is pointed out what they do is they withdraw the notice and then file another notice and do you think our clients can afford that so what is important is to address the core issue rather than rather than taking up this i mean it is all right for the moment maybe you have to do that but uh, but i think we need to concentrate on on if 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 the client doesn't have title of course and he is a totally illegal occupant of course then you need to advise the client to say that you uh, you may not succeed in this game that long maybe you can take up some objection just to give him some time <coughs> but a genuine bona fide possessor of land who has been given land by the state and who has been alerted i think you need to advise them to file a reivindicatory action as early as possible as permitted by the law and as the common law provides rather than going behind these taking this technical objection and winning the battle and losing the whole thing i have received some questions from our viewers one of it is uh, if a grant is given under section 44 of the ldo for a specific purpose say to build residential apartments if the person is using the premises for another person can the government cancel such a grant i think vikum might be the best person to answer. answer yes <laughs> vikum before i answer that question might i uh, answer uh, rather give my point of view on two issues one is uh, the the district court jurisdiction over state land uh, so the section 19 of the judicature act give power to the district court to hear and determine cases on one hand on the other hand section 23 and 24 of the interpretation ordinance restricts that power so say for instance if the if the termination of permit or the cancellation of the permit is a statutory decision or the decision by the by the divisional secretary that decision cannot be challenged in the district court so section 23 is very clear on that and however without challenging that decision and if you have suffered losses as a result of that the proviso says that you can go to the district court and claim damages so i think uh, I, i think it is futile or, or rather it will be a futile effort if you just go and challenge the division of secretary's decision in the district court or or maybe in the quick note as mr manohar is you know right pointed out there are maybe instances where you can go because you know the the party side variant but but on the but in the issues like the district the division of secretary has uh, uh, cancelled the permit for some reason then i then you can't go to the district court you have to challenge challenge that by way of uh, by way of uh, writ the the second point 
you raise those this 30 days notice uh, issue so it is not a mandatory it is not a mandatory provision. now say for instance you give notice uh, day and ask him to wait within 30 days but if you you file papers under section 5 maybe 100 days after that then the court held in the case of munaratna versus abesi reported in 88 one sla page 253 court held that uh, that that defect uh, can be uh, ignored uh, so the question you asked the the final question you asked was the uh, whether if a, if a permit is given for a particular permit particular reason and if that reason is in the permit itself i think then then if you if you do something else then the permit can be cancelled uh, because if you look at these provisions uh, starting from section 108 onward because you are a wild condition in the permit thank you then we come i want to ask you another question now uh, in the interpretation you get the various state agencies uh under section 80 and uh, you get for example uh, the uda sri lanka ports authority if a, another government agency which is not listed under this if they purport to file under this act uh claiming to resort to this procedure to evict a person what is your view on that Sorry, the, there is a uh, so if if you if there if you look at the word competent authority, yes, uh, it says uh, now if you look at section eighty, it says if you go uh, down, it says head of the government department or institution created by law where such land is under the control of that department or authority. So that's a fairly wide provision where if a if a land is given to a particular authority. and if the if, because because this this amendment came in uh, in fact to because uh, because there is a list and what happens if there is an institution outside the list yes. so in order to address that issue this amendment came in so if a particular land is in a is a control of a government authority or the department or authority uh, so then the then the head of that institution can be the competent authority in terms of the law Yes. Then we have received some more questions uh, from our viewers. Um, LDO permitted land without mentioning the successor owners have died. Younger brother, it's a bit of a long question. Uh, There's a question from Miss Sudarshini. Can a Jayabhumi land, if if the land is given by a grant, can it be given to a third party? Sudarshini, it's addressed to you. Yes, uh, yes, Tushani. Uh, yes. Like I explained earlier, you can you can give it to a third party with the prior approval of the divisional secretary. That is under Section 194B. That is a there's a procedure you have to. get the approval from the division secretary you have to give the draft uh, transfer deed to the division secretary for approval so there is a procedure you can uh, transfer it to a third party right then um other questions are pending in the They have also. There is another question: Can a Jayabhumi land be sold by a holder to another party? Same, same, uh, same, uh, same question. Dushani, uh, there was a question uh, referred earlier that uh, section forty-four of the land development ordinance, if I am not mistaken, now is it section forty-four of the land development ordinance? No, section. Forty-four. The land bill are repealed. Repealed. That is such. Sir. I was wondering yes, uh, why. If a grant is given under Section forty-four of the LDO for a specific purpose. That's the thing, Tushani. Now, uh, I think, uh, like uh, Mr. Manohar said, uh, 
uh, that uh, section has been repealed by Act Number Sixteen of Nineteen Sixty Nine, sir. Is, is am I correct, sir? Yeah, yeah that's correct. Yeah. Yes. So I think uh, that question is uh, incorrect. Eleven. Yes. Uh, but the principle, I think, is the uh, is correct. If it, there is a condition and you violate the conditions, uh, uh, then the state can, uh, I suppose, cancel it. If yes. there is some condition in the in the in the grant, even in the grant, sir, there are certain conditions. Yes. So, so if now, you, it is important, as Darshini, now to send this message across. The whole purpose of the land development ordinance is to develop land. That is yes. the state. Because to to enhance and strengthen our economy, to see that this being an agricultural country, to ensure that agricultural lands remain agricultural and and development take place. Now, yeah. what happens is if we remove this condition from this act, which an attempt was made recently, which was which was not allowed by the Supreme Court, is to remove and give absolute ownership to. Now, although it looks very democratic and Looks very nice uh, uh, from the perspective of individual rights. What would happen is people can just sell their agricultural land, and on the next day it will be a junkyard of some company. So yeah. uh, and it will definitely affect our economy. So I mean, uh, large lands can be bought by foreign companies and uh, not contribute to our economy and development. So this is a very important provision that restriction because land is given. For you to participate in the development and uh, the building the economy of the country, and and uh, I mean this is not something uh, that was uh, just put there, but for a purpose. And I think that we need to see that that is ensured because anybody who uh, who has the opportunity of selling their land and going into some uh, flat or something in Colombo might do that, and uh, ultimately all our agricultural land will be lost. So I think uh, the the rationale behind This is also must be kept in mind. Then we have received. Sorry, sorry. Sushani, now, now, uh, sir, Manohara, sir, now with that uh, disposition uh, section, section nineteen yeah. four B. So, do you think we need reforms in the land development ordinance that we have to restrict uh, alienation of property to third parties under the grants? I think so. because if 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 the purpose of land development ordinance is to develop land and somebody is going to uh, alienate land mm. which is contrary to development the whole objective of the act is not achieved that's right yes yes I so mean, uh, big, uh, no, even on a grant the yeah, big responsibility rests with the divisional secretary when he is giving permission to alienate land Uh, to see whether it should be done or not according yeah, to the those area con- yeah, those conditions now if it is an agricultural land uh, uh, and it was given to x for purpose of agriculture then if he wants to alienate it the the, uh, the successor also must do agriculture i mean if that is our plan there is a master plan that we have certain zones are for agriculture certain for industries and so on now Yeah, the, the, if we are going outside the that development plan, I think those conditions must be fulfilled. So even if you allow alienation, it must be subject to the conditions of the state that uh, state imposes. So that is what is important. That's a, that's the that's the rationale behind this law. Yes, yes. Then, uh, sir, what about this? Uh, the third schedule. There is. people are concerned about the fact that only the elder son yeah i think it is it violates article 12 1 and i think it's it sometimes it's a disgrace to have that list in that way because mm-hmm. if the, if the eldest child is a girl why should the second child be given because uh, in today uh, i mean we all accept that uh, there can't be any difference between a uh, uh, Male or uh, uh, depending on your sex, so I think we you, we have to correct it as Sorry. early as possible because I think it's a disgrace to have it on your statute. Statute. Of course, Vikram, what have you got to say about that? Have you all made any proposals? 
in regards uh, uh, no, i think i should not answer that question that way i think if i'm not mistaken there was a move some time back to amend I, I don't know the manual because the is a way because to amend the 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 the, the brand development ordinance so probably uh, uh, i don't know what has happened to that uh so i don't have to add anything but i just want to uh, just uh, respond to uh, mr shant jawadana said about his judgment where actually i'm aware about that judgment i think shant appeared for the for the petitioner in that case on rescue card uh, what i if i what i explain was that if we withdraw it on technical ground because it's a continuing offense and if we withdraw it on technical ground we can always file because so that is what i said even in that judgment uh, the, the lordship uh, judge says that the judgment of mine shall not be understood that this is where the case is i think he's he's also on the the point of restricted card he just he's all says restricted card doesn't apply in every instance uh, so probably uh, shant uh, said that in that uh, so in that way uh, so uh, so that is what i had to say about the uh, restricted card uh, so if you have uh, any other question i am um, um can i respond to 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 sorry yes go ahead chan go ahead uh, sorry you can then perhaps may i i may have heard it wrong i th i thought uh, you said the restricted card applies across the board uh, whether it's uh, no, no, sorry, no, 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 otherwise no, no, no. sorry i think i then i misheard it and then i have uh, i have uh, two responses to or other additions to what mr manohar silva said one is about the uh, solemuttu rasa's case and as uh, of course uh, mr disila appeared uh, as appeared in the case that that is uh, is obviously a replication challenging a quick notice in the high court and and of course i i don't i don't say the judgment I, I, of course that judgment i i believe is correct to say that the provincial high court has no jurisdiction but what now i have seen is in in many instances i have seen when a, uh, once the uh, the magistrate court proceedings are over and if the order is against the respondent that is in, if the order is in favor of the state rejecting the party and when when the party or the citizen files a revision in the high court i have seen very often in fact i i, I face that objection in mblpt high court the objection is raised that the provincial high court has no revisionary jurisdiction against the magistrate court uh, against the order of the magistrate court because so let me to raza i think uh, uh, yes, yes, i believe possible. i don't know i think what mr disilva has to say but i think that is that is a wrong application of the judgment writ application is is yes the, the high court has no jurisdiction but if the magistrate had jurisdiction then surely the revisionary power has to be there in the high court because uh, because uh, those are two separate sections yes article 154 b4 says if unless there is in the provincial list you can uh, file a writ application that has nothing to do with revision revision yes. so but i have i have seen that objection being raised even in in i so Yeah, without what happened that was raised but uh, i don't know whether it is any ruling subsequent ruling and also with regard to the permit holder reference to the the the, the mr disilas comment on the permit holder and uh, there is a judgment somewhere in 2004 uh, which goes as karunavati jayamaha versus jed we perhaps mr diabro is aware a very short judgment by slow chief justice gps de silva saying that all the, the although the the citizen or the, or the member of the public had no the occupier had no permit a document as a permit he had paid the dues to the state so that was interpreted is to he, as as a permit so the moment you pay and you have the they have the have proof of payment then that was inter, interpreted to that say that he is a permit holder that is why the because in 1969 the permit holder interpretation was wide so now you don't need to have that piece of paper if you have been allocated the land and the government has given but you don't have the permit you are you are within it so i think it goes in line with the that amendment which came to the term yes 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 because this they, they, they only wanted to add those two things yeah even though they have land card series it takes a number of years for them to actually get the that piece of paper the actual permit their name might appear in the tenement list but of course it takes years 
and of course there is another 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 issue i, I don't have to to uh, to uh, uh, see what mr de silva and mr abru has to say and of course sudarshan as well now even under the under the land development ordinance has a procedure for ejection some in section 120 there is a procedure for ejection so the land state lands ordinance refers to section 120 under the land development ordinance for for ejection then there is a judgment of the court of appeal in edwin versus tilakarat which says that if there is a specific procedure laid down in a particular statute then to eject you have to have to resort to that procedure and not the not the general procedure under the state lands recovery i uh, just were keen to know what mr disilva and, and the other I panelists have to say absolutely correct because i think it's a, there is a long standing uh, series of authorities on this uh, even i think mansur versus uh, uh, there was that 66 case we are we are the court held that you can resort to section 66 this case no sir if you are a tenant cultivator you have to resort to the provisions of the uh, yes. yes and i think uh, 69 nl or i i forget the names of that very fair, it originates from that uh, uh where there is a specific remedy you must resort to the specific remedy. and i think from the your correct my, my my view is that uh, if there is a specific remedy you have to resort to that but sometimes sir the problem is uh, the divisional secretary style to resort to the state lands recovery because that's a quicker method of uh, evicting uh, them uh, yeah but if the state land uh, ordinance uh, uh, provides that and it is a permit yes. or grant issued under the state i don't think you can resort to some other other law exactly when it's under the land development law that is because I, if there is a remedy yeah, I, i have not examined it but if there is as shanta says if there is a remedy then you have to resort to that resort to that except some divisional secretaries don't do that sir that is what some yeah. of us have faced face so abru should advise them properly uh, no <laughs> well uh, i i think the, the just just to intervene at this point when there is a specific procedure laid down the parties must seek recourse to uh, that procedure i think that is la- that is laid down in 69 and till 29 judgment so i think because the as far as this when the permit is cancelled so there is a specific procedure laid down because especially that will apply uh, after uh, after after following the relevant procedure in the law itself and if that one person is not leaving then you have to seek recourse to that procedure i, I don't think uh, divisional secretaries uh, the, apply state land recovery for that uh, so that is uh, my understanding uh, on that because what they generally what they do is they apply that for Yes, of course. Only. Now we have to wrap up. So I thank all of you uh, for participating. I would, on behalf of all the panel, I would like to of expressing our views on state. Thank you for the wonderful job done by the moderator. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you.